Yeah, so the wood itself was uh, donated by the Canadian Forest Service through Natural Resources Canada uh, and was part of uh, an old growth forest preserve up in Algonquin Park. So they donated two 32 foot pieces and the thing that makes the wood so exceptional, while well, you can see this is uh, probably one or two thirds of the diameter of the log that I started out with. And the poles themselves were part of an old growth uh, forest preserve north of Pembroke in Algonquin Park. And they blew down in a tornado or a big storm. You know, part of the deal was, at least in my mind, was to use this wood, to use this wood for something special. So what I did is then went to the Assembly of First Nations and told them that I would donate uh, a carving to their Make Poverty History campaign. And the Make Poverty History campaign uh, helps to put food on the table and breakfast uh, in schools for kids in some of the poorer First Nation, remote near First Nation communities. So it's white pine. Normally the, the wood that would be used uh, would be western red cedar. I like carving the white pine a lot more than I like carving the red cedar because of the way the wood responds. So red cedar is very uh, porous, so you have to have extremely sharp tools or else it burrs it, it lifts it up. Whereas white pine is a little bit more pliable, it's more plastic-like, and it's easier to make these nice smooth cuts. Colors are a lot different as well, so there's a lot more, there's a lot of, I think a lot more difference or contrast in this wood, the pulp wood, the sap wood, than there is in, in cedar. So it's, it becomes a little bit more dramatic and you can use the, the grain in the wood to highlight the movement in certain areas, especially where you've got contours running out, complex contours around the eyes, things like that, these uh, concave surfaces as well. The style of carving is based upon West Coast style, and I formally studied both Nachalnuth and Niska style. And when I was going to art school, had the good fortune of hanging out around Bill Reed's studio and living close to Robert Davidson, getting there on the weekends. So the Haida style was a very significant influence as well because of those two characters. So what I've done is I've not used the traditional Northwest Coast style, I've adapted it uh, so that it was my own signature style and it wouldn't be confused with anybody carving on the West Coast. So what I'm doing here is I've taken an adapted West Coast carving style with an Eastern white uh, or an Eastern white pine and I'm telling, the story that I'm telling is done proportionate to the West Coast style, but I'm using a Cree legend. And the Cree legend is my background. So my grandmother was Cree from up in the uh, James Bay area. So I've used cr traditional Cree legend. Now the legend itself 
It is a story of uh, medicine man in the tree. So the me a medicine man was cast by a spell into the tree from a shaman for carrying on, let's just say he was carrying on the black arts. As a punishment, he was put into the tree, he was cast into the tree. And a young woman comes along one day gathering firewood and chopping up firewood and chops open or chops down this tree and out springs this little medicine man. And so she takes him back to the, uh, to the village and becomes part of her household. And through his black arts, he gets her pregnant and nobody can figure out, or she certainly can't figure out how she would become pregnant. Her father gets all upset and she doesn't know, she can't explain it. She doesn't know anything about what this little medicine man has done. And so her father thinks he's just not telling him the truth. So he assembles all the men in the village. Now, the owl figure is an honesty or truth character and a guardian of sorts to the woman. So the owl is always keeping an eye on the woman. When she travels in the woods, the owl is not far off. Now, the owl has witnessed this little medicine man's uh, hijinks. And when it comes to, everyone's denying it, nobody knows anything about it. And when it comes to the medicine man, he begins to deny it as well. And so as soon as the owl, who's perched up on the wall, uh, here's his denial, the owl spits at him. And the spit is forcing him to, to be honest. So he's drawing attention to the fact that the uh, medicine man is lying. And the medicine man tells the truth. The father forces him into marriage. But before the marriage, the, uh, the maiden is all distraught because she doesn't want to marry this little dwarf character. So the shaman comes up with a solution of putting the dwarf man in a shaking tent. And the shaking tent allows the transformation into the spirit world. So from animal to spirit to human, the shaking tent is where that can take place. So he goes into the shaking tent and in the shaking tent ceremony, the man undergoes, the dwarf man undergoes a transformation and comes out of the shaking tent transformed into a full-sized, handsome, young brave. They get married and live happily ever after. So here's the owl sitting perched on the woman's head, the woman's tongue out uh, over top of the head of the dwarf man. And the tongues are usually signifying the life-giving, uh, the transformation of energy from one animal spirit to another or an animal to human, or human to spirit world. So there's the three elements in this transformation in the world. One is the spirit world, one is the natural world, and the other is the human world. And a lot of times a tongue would signify the transference of spirit from one figure to another.